My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Vegas 84 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and bets. But before I do, go take our survey, right? We have about 3,000 premium members. We emailed every single one of you a survey about premium membership, asking what features you use, what features you would like added, what other content you would like. It's a couple of questions, and all of that will help drive the rest of this year. We use the survey results to figure out where we're going to invest money. We use the survey results to figure out what tools are we going to add? What are we going to enhance? What should we hone in? So your feedback is incredibly important to us as we continue to evolve, continue to add, and continue to make this premium membership the greatest offering in this space. It already is, but if you ain't growing, you're dying, boys. And we're going to grow and we're going to improve that product time and time again. So fill out the survey. It'll just take you a few minutes. And to encourage you to do so, we're going to give one lucky survey filler outer $100. So we'll pull a name. We'll throw you 100 bucks. So fill out the survey. Make sure your email address is in there when you fill it out. So that when we pull the winner and I don't know, maybe a week we'll give you to fill it all out. We'll go ahead and uh, give somebody 100 bucks. You can find the survey in your inbox. We emailed it to everybody. You can also find it in the premium alerts channel in the discord or on your account page, log in to premium, click on account. You'll see it right there on your account page. Your feedback is very important to us, the product, and then ultimately you. So thank you for that. And if you're wondering why there was just a jump cut edit this early into a video, it's because I have the flu. I've got the flu. Two days ago, it was pretty rough. Yesterday was a little better. Today, is as close to looking like Ben Affleck and sounding like James Earl Jones as this going to get for me. Almost back to normal here. So you're going to see some jump cuts, and that's really to edit out coughs and sneezes and whatever else comes with the flu. So that has sucked, but we are back on track. This is what UFC 296 has looked like for me. I crushed UFC 296. I've been enjoying the fruits of that labor for the last couple of weeks. My picks were on point, safety parlay dominated, and the safety parlay continues to be a point of pride for me. We have hit four of the last five events of the safety parlay. Some events, I give you more than one parlay. We have hit six of the last seven parlays that I put together. It's averaging 1.79 units of net profit, and that average includes weeks off. The three weeks we just got, it's included into that. The times where we go a week without fights, it's included. So the 1.79 units of net profit average includes time off. It's a huge success. I'm very proud of it. The safety parlay for UFC Vegas 84 is up and available right now for premium members. Just wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top if you are not a premium member today. It's only freaking $10. I, I paused so your brain can process how affordable that is, and you're going to get way more than just bets. You're going to get tools like the line movement tracker. This card has had two shuffled fights, two dropped fights, but as of right now with the final card with 12 fights and two new opponents, only one fighter line has flipped. That's Jim Miller, open as a dog. Going to probably close as a favorite. He is a favorite on some books, even money on others. And then seven fighters have had 20% line movement or more. You're also going to get the detailed data metrics and analytics. This is a 38-column spreadsheet with information about striking history, grappling history, average takedown defense, their biometrics, their last five record, all sorts of odds. This is a giant spreadsheet with detailed information so you can work your way across and find prop bets and find spots that make sense for you. Not only do you get the whole huge spreadsheet, we slice and dice it for you into digestible sections that are on the website that you can sort and interact with as well. All of this and a million other things that I'm not gonna mention because people start to complain about how long this intro is are available right now for premium members, only $10 a month, we want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Don't forget to follow our socials, that costs nothing. And we genuinely, greatly appreciate it. We're on every single platform as we want picks. And then we have a second YouTube channel, which is Picks Nation. Subscribe, follow, do all those things. And we appreciate you for it. You could also send some mail. I do the Fight Foods vlogs. There will be a bonus Fight Food vlogs popping up any day now. I finished filming it the other day. It's a lot of footage. The editor's putting it together. That may pop up, hopefully, Today or tomorrow. Today is Saturday. On those vlogs, we open mail. Feel free to mail us whatever you want. We will open it. We will talk about it. We'll eat it. 
Somebody sent some hot sauce that disagreed with me for about four or five days. We'll eat it. Here's the address to do all of that. There's your intro. What did that clock in at? Five minutes. Come on, five minutes. Let's go ahead and break down this card. This is one of these switcheroo fights. Felipe Bunes was originally stacked up against Dennis Bandar, which was a much different fight, a much more winnable fight. Now he has Joshua Van, much trickier fight. So opening up the UFC Vegas 84 fight card, we have Felipe Bunes taking on Josh Van. Felipe Bunes is a BJJ black belt. He's got some pretty slick submissions. He's always looking for something on the ground, and he is very fast in transitions and scrambles. Felipe is not a nerd. He's not a BJJ nerd. He's not going to be trying to scoot his butt across the ground pulling guard. He will engage on the feet. He will shoot actual takedowns. He loves throwing a big straight and then a huge overhand and then will transition right into a takedown from there. If you take him down, you're going to need to defend because even off of his back, he's very active. He is always looking for something. He'll create a little bit of an opening and then try to turn it into a scramble. If you recognize the name, that's because he was supposed to make his UFC debut last year against Zalgas Zumagulov, but that fight was scrapped at the last minute, and Josh Van actually stepped up and beat the piss out of Zalgas Zumagulov, and now they're fighting each other in just, I mean, what a, what a, if it's not a perfect circle, I don't know what is. We got Josh Van. This dude is only 22 years old, and he's looking for his third UFC win. Style-wise, he's a solid striker. He's aggressive. He's got a little bit of power. Takedown defense, scramble skills, those are just okay. And he's this new generation of fighter. So even though he's primarily a striker when he's in there in style, he's pretty much good everywhere. Didn't have a specific background in anything. He can grapple. He can strike and do all the things. He does have a nice-looking scramble. And I know a scramble is not just one thing, but if you end up in a scramble with him, he does scramble well. They look good. His hips are where they're supposed to be. He's popping, he's moving, he's circling, he's doing the right things. And he can end up on top or he can end up out of that exchange entirely. So I do like his scramble skills, even though his takedown defense isn't spectacular. He's coming off a pretty hard-fought win over Kevin Borjas, where he was tagged a couple of times and he did give up a round. But ultimately, at the end of the day, he won that fight. He had two takedowns and he doubled the total significant strikes. Josh is stepping up on short notice, about two weeks, I think, week and a half, two weeks, something like that. Actually, by the time fight night comes, it'll be a full two weeks, maybe even a touch more. I'm still confident that he's going to get this done. I think his performance against Zalgas in his short notice UFC debut was actually better than his last performance, which was against Kevin Borjas. Hopefully, that's not some weird indication of like a slide in his skills or in his performances. I don't think it will be. I think Josh is going to win this fight, but if Felipe can get Josh to the ground, he's got a very real chance to win here. But Josh's striking is going to be faster. It's going to be more accurate. He should have good enough striking, good enough scramble skills to just keep him well away from any trouble that may be waiting for him on the ground. I do have a money line bet on Josh. I threw a unit and a half on him at minus 225. I'm going to leave it there, though. I'm not going to parlay him. Ultimately, he's still a little bit unproven. He's only 22 years old, and he did not look spectacular in his last fight. I still do think he's wins. I'm confident in that. I stand by the bet that I placed, but I don't think Josh Van is ready yet to be overly exposed to. I don't know if you can hear. I'm I'm getting stuffier as I talk. I woke up this morning. I was like, I'm back, baby. 95%. I've been giving people percentage updates. 95%. I am back. And then as... As I'm filming this, I'm I'm down to 80. This is it, this literally sucks the life out of me. That's how much I put in. I am putting my health into these things. Next up, we have Nicholas Mata taking on Tom Nolan. Nicholas Mata, 13 and 5. He's got a good amount of experience, way more experience than Tom Nolan does. And Tom Nolan is the big time favorite here. And I get it. He's a long, lean striker. His frame is almost identical to Corey Sanhagen's, right? He's a little bit lurchy, but he's long, and he uses that really well. His striking is very good. I said his striking was better than Corey Sanhagen's in that other breakdown, and people were like, oh, how can you? That's ridiculous. Shut up. Shut up. Tom Nolan is a very, very good striker. He's a little unorthodox, but he's very accurate. He's very technical. He has no problem getting into a brawl. He's got a solid chin as well. And while you break down tape, 
I watched him eat more than one big overhand right, and he just kept coming forward, kept making stuff happen. He's got lots of pressure, lots of volume, a ton of power. Takedown defense sucks, though. He's definitely not a very good grappler. Takedown defense is not there. It kind of sucks. But he's taking on Nicholas Mata. This guy's not exactly a takedown machine. He averages exactly zero takedowns per fight. He's a very good striker, though. He's explosive. He's athletic. He moves well with his speed. He's got diversity in his strikes. He's got solid takedown defense at 82%, and that allows him to get loose striking because he trusts that he'll stay on his feet. He does a very good job being patient and then just pouring it on when he sees his opportunity. He's coming off that early submission loss to Trey Ogden, which was overturned because it was clear that the ref made a mistake. With that being said, he was losing that fight. This is one of two fights on the card that I go back and forth on. While I'm confident that Tom Nolan is going to win, We got a Nicholas Mata here. We have a guy that's a dangerous striker. We have a guy who's fast. We have a guy who's got a ton of UFC experience and a ton of just general MMA experience. He's a UFC vet. He's got quality wins. I'm still going to go Nolan here, though. I do think Nolan is the better striker. He's got wild grappling holes. I don't think that's going to matter at all here. No one's going to win. Trey Ogden was completely outstriking Mata, and Nolan is 50 times the striker that Trey Ogden is. No one's going to be the pick. He's minus 330 right now. I do think those odds are a little bit tough to work with. I think they're too much for a money line. Uh, you know, while I'm confident him to win, Nicholas's veteran savvy scares me just a little bit. So right now I'm going to sit on it. We'll see what happens. Maybe I'll parlay Tom Nolan to get a little bit better value, but that's how you end up in some trouble. He is a UFC debut fighting one of the better guys that he could fight stepping in like this. So I'm probably going to leave this fight alone entirely, but I am pretty confident in Tom Nolan to win this fight. But this is where we get caught with our pants down, right? How often have people watched like this exact situation? Oh, Nicholas Mata looked like shit in his last fight. His opponent doesn't look like shit. His opponent should win. And people do that very easy one, two, three, connect the dots. And all of a sudden, Nicholas Mata looks great because in every fight other than his last fight, he's looked pretty good. So I'm going to stay away. Minus 330 is a lot for a UFC debut with only six fights under his belt. But I do still think that Tom Nolan wins. Man, I am getting stuffier. and stuff. So I've been blasting Afrin. I don't know if you're Afrin is. You go, and you breathe like a, the best breathing you've ever done. The problem is the bottle is like, If you do this more than three days in a row, your heart is going to explode. And normally I ignore stuff like that, but I I feel like I put my heart through a little bit too much as it is. So maybe Afrin shouldn't be added to the situation. And when I went to the doctor that they, when they were like, yeah, you got the flu, bud. I said, oh, I've been taking Afrin. And the doctor was like, what is, throw that out. I'm like, but it works. And she's like, yeah, it works by shrinking your blood vessels. So. Anyway, there's a medical lesson for you, but I, the breathing's a little tough right now. I wouldn't mind blasting a little bit of Afrin. Anyway, I mean, Weston Wilson, that dude could take some Afrin in. Holy shit. Next up at UFC Vegas 84, we have Weston Wilson. He's taking on Jean Silva. And Jean Silva is a massive favorite. Biggest favorite on this card. Biggest favorite in the next couple of cards. This guy's a minus 800 right now. He's a powerful striker. He's loose. He's creative. And his creativity is fun to watch, but it does get him into some weird positions. And he's interesting to watch because he's going to go from tight guard to just loose hands down. And then it'll alternate between the two. Like you watch him two minutes into a fight. He looks good. He's tight. He's doing all the right things. Then all of a sudden his hands are loose. They're at his hips. He's throwing them from wild far away. And it keeps his opponents guessing. Like what the hell is this guy going to do? He lowers his level. He'll land body shots right to the stomach. He will lower like he's going to shoot. And then boom. Blast the body. Then come back up. Boom. Blast the head. Takedown defense is solid. His striking is absolutely savage. Taking on Weston Wilson. This guy's a karate style striker. He's got low hands. A lot of in and out movement. Can be a bit hesitant though. He can be hittable as well. But when he hits his flow, he likes to rush forward, throw heavy. He's very tall for this weight class. He uses that length well on the ground. Not necessarily on his feet, but on the ground, he uses that length really well. Does not have the best wrestling. But he is dangerous enough on the ground. He's always looking to wrap something up. He's coming off a short notice mauling by Joe Anderson Brito. But, I mean, that's Joe Anderson Brito. John Silva, as I mentioned, tremendous minus 800 favorite. He was minus 725 when I broke this fight down a few weeks ago. 
it's widened a touch to minus 800. It's always funny when lines move like that. Because at minus 725, that means you have to spend $725 to win 100. So people saw that and were like, yeah, I'll do that. And it continued to stretch even more. So people are very, very confident in Jean Silva. And I think most of it has nothing to do with Jean Silva's skill sets. Unfortunately, I think it has very much to do with how little people think of Weston Wilson and his skills. I agree Jean is going to win. I agree if this is standing, Weston Wilson is not going to have much to offer. But if it gets to the ground, and all of a sudden, long, lanky Weston Wilson could make something happen. The dude is 6'1 at featherweight. And he is long on the ground. He's rangy on the ground. He can make something happen on the ground. Jean Silva throws a lazy kick, does something weird. Weston drags him to the ground. Weston can win this fight. It's not going to happen. I mean, it's a fist fight. It'll happen one out of a hundred times, two out of a hundred times. But I'm not touching UFC debut Jean Silva at minus 800. He's going to win. I'm not parlaying him at these odds. I'm going to leave it alone. But Jean Silva is the clear pick here. Can't justify those odds. Not for a UFC. De- you want to get those odds on Bo Nickel fighting somebody that everybody's positive he's going to win? Okay, that means he's proven a few times that he can win fights. Jean Silva hasn't proved anything. Not yet. So this line has everything to do with his opponent, nothing to do with him. Well, a little bit to do with him, obviously. Anyway, that's a lot of talking about this one fight that everybody's going to pick the same person. Jean Silva's the pick. Don't touch those odds. Then we have a controversial fight, I will say. A lot of people in the comments, Taylor by KO, Taylor by KO. And I don't know if you guys comment that because... It's just fun to say shit. And then in the 10% chance you're correct, 5% chance you're correct, you can be the the fake comment hero. I don't know if that's why people do it or if they're genuinely like, no, Taylor is going to win this by knockout. And that's how I feel. I feel very strongly about it. And I'm going to comment it everywhere. But we've gotten a lot of Lapalus by knockout comments. Like a lot of them. More than, who the hell is he knocking out? But apparently they think he's going to knock out this guy. Anyway, we got Fareed Bajarat taking on Taylor Lapis. Fareed's a pretty well-rounded guy. He's a good wrestler. Solid striking. He's got a loose stance. He's going to bounce on his toes. He's going to throw a lot of kicks. He's very mobile. He's constantly working from side to side. He's got that whole Taekwondo stance thing that helps him move really well and stay defensively sound. He is a beast of a wrestler that will time his takedowns perfectly and many times just use those to keep the fight standing. That wrestling is there to keep the fight standing in a lot of his fights. He's coming off that submission win over Clayton Rodriguez where he did use his offensive wrestling and his takedowns really, really well. He's taking on Taylor Lapalus. This guy's not a very good wrestler. He's a very good kickboxer with incredible footwork. He does a really good job working in and out of range. He comes in for his tax, throws a combination, and then strikes on his way out. By the time most people throw something back, he's gone. He's out of the pocket. Taylor taking Taylor down is definitely going to be your path to victory, but it's not going to be that easy, right? He does a pretty good job defending takedowns. He's going to stuff the head. He's going to work the hips instead of just throwing these meaningless pot shots that end you up on the ground. End you up on the ground. That end up with you on the ground. Anyway, the point I'm making there is a lot of people, a lot of fighters, instead of working their hips out, stuffing the head, getting their hips back, working inside to defend the takedown, they'll just do like these these shots. I'll tell you right now, a wrestler that wants you on the ground will take these shots any day of the week to get it to the ground. Taylor does not do this nonsense. He stuffs the head. He widens his base. He actually defends the takedown. He is coming off that win over Kowlin Lochran, where he was just too patient, too hesitant, and did not let his hands go. And this is going to be a Fareed play all day. He's the pick. I'm very confident in him. I'm good with Fareed winning this fight. We just had Kowlin Lochran take down Taylor Lapalus twice. And Fareed is 10 times the wrestler that Cowlin is, not to mention also a very good striker. I think Taylor's going to be far too patient. And I think Fareed is going to win just on the feet. He's going to win the grappling exchanges. He's going to win with forward pressure. And he's not going to wait for Taylor to do what Taylor wants to do. When I broke this fight down three weeks ago, Fareed Bajrat was minus 170. Right now, he sits at minus 245 which I think is a very fair line. I like the over two and a half here as well. And I have that in a parlay. All the people commenting Taylor by KO, where is that coming from? Even if you think he can win this fight, which fine, there's 
points to make that he could win this fight. That by KO, when have we seen Farid almost knocked out or knocked out? And who the hell is Taylor knocking out? That's why I think a lot of these comments are just nonsense comments. To uh, A, either get a reaction like you're getting right now, or B, maybe something crazy happens. You're just an anonymous person in the comments, and then you come back to it and you screenshot it. I'm the genius member. I'm the genius that 11 months ago said Taylor by KO. Anyway, Taylor's not winning this fight. He's not winning this fight by knockout. And if you disagree with me, I will put a comment or a link or a comment and a link in the description to my bet openly bet. I'll throw a couple hundred dollars on Fareed. And if you're confident in Taylor, well, then grab the other side. And if you win that bet, you literally take my money. Bet openly, this isn't even a paid plug. Bet openly is peer-to-peer -peer betting, person-to-person. -person. It's not a sports book. It's not a casino. I put up my money, you put up your money, and they are just a facilitator to make sure that you don't disappear into the ether of the internet once you lose your bet. That's all that is. But the cool part is you can brag about taking somebody's actual money. Somebody in Discord was running their mouth a little while ago. I threw up a bet openly. I took their money. I bought a sandwich with it. I posted that picture. This is your $10. I've lost as well, but yeah, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. Then we have... Marcus McGee taking on Gaston Bolanos. Like every time, look at the dude's face. Tell me if you had to say, if I said draw what you think a Gaston looks like, we all draw this. What else would you draw? He looks like the Gaston from the Disney movies. Da, 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 like Gaston, da, 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 like Gaston. This is, this is, this is it. That's a Gaston. Marcus could be, I know a Marcus. He's Hispanic. Marcus could be anything. Gaston, just this. Anyway, we got Marcus. This is listen. I've already broken down this card. I'm coming off the flu. I haven't left the house in a very long time. So this it's gonna be a it's gonna be a little bit of rambling in this video. It's fine, guys. It's fine. We got Marcus McGee. The guy's a powerful guy. He's got heavy hands. Good takedowns, one-punch knockouts all over his record. His takedown defense is solid. He's got slick submissions, and he uses those in scrambles. He sets a pace. He carries his power late in the fights, and he's coming off back-to-back -back stoppage wins in the UFC. The most recent one was over J.P. Bays. And remember, all these people, oh, but J.P.'s training with Al Jermaine. J.P.'s over there with Marab. His wrestling's going to be so good. Was it? Taking on Gaston Bolanos. This guy's a solid striker, solid Muay Thai background. He's got good power. He will engage. He's no problem engaging in a fight. His claim to fame is Muay Thai world champion. And even a handful of his MMA fights, spinning back elbows. He did it in Muay Thai. He did it in MMA. He does have some grappling holes, and that's going to be exploited. But you're going to need to get through his guard. You're going to need to get through that striking to even think about the grappling He's coming off a UFC debut win over Aaron Phillips, where he won the first round, was taken down a few times, and then showed a few low fight IQ moments, but he was able to pull that off. Marcus right now, almost a 3-1 to one favorite. I get it. He should be. He has power. He can wrestle. He's tough. The thing that is concerning, though, is Gaston's a very good striker. He could absolutely catch Marcus on the feet, and while... He's been showing off his power successfully. I think Marcus needs to lean on the wrestling. Do not strike with the world champion Muay Thai striker. Just wrestle. The easiest path to victory. Come forward, wrestle, and then work from there. Marcus is going to be the pick because he's just so dangerous. He's got a very clear path. But Gaston Bolanos is not J.P. Bays. I don't necessarily think this is going to be a super quick throw three punches, get him out of there kind of fight. Marcus could see himself in a little bit of an actual dogfight here. We haven't seen wrestling out of him in the UFC, but he hasn't needed it. I hope we do see it. I got Marcus McGee in a little bit of a parlay. That premium members, you can see that. That has been available for a while now. We want picks.com. Click become a member if you're not a premium member. Start the year off with a bang. It's freaking $10. And we got a whole bunch of cards coming up. Unlock the safety parlay, all the bets, the picks, round line leans, the tools, everything. And it's for eight analysts, not just me, not just handsome Jake. Eight of us doing that. Unlock all of that. We on picks.com. Click become a member at the top. And then we have Preston Parsons taking on short notice. 
Matt Semmelsberger. Preston Parsons originally had a much different opponent, a much tougher fight. I think this is an easier fight for Preston Parsons. But anyway, this is a bit of a grappler versus striker type matchup. It's 2024, everybody's good at everything, blah, 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 blah. But for the most part, Matt's going to be looking for that big power. Preston's going to be looking to grind and wrestle and get it done. And it's going to be an interesting matchup. We got Preston Parsons. He's got 10 wins. Nine of them are by submission. He's a BJJ black belt. He moves forward aggressively. He throws big shots to set up takedowns. And while he is a dangerous grappler, he can be a bit clueless when he cannot get that grappling going. He's almost a takedown or bust kind of guy. He's coming off that loss to Trevin Giles where he did drop Trevin with a borderline lucky strike, but then he gassed in the second round, gassed on the ground. His showcase is toughness, which is always nice to see. Like, obviously, he didn't win that fight, but he did show us that he's a tough, durable guy that'll just keep coming forward, take his abuse, take his beating. So I left that last fight with Preston Parsons thinking, well, if he can't grapple, I don't know what he can do, but I know he's tough as hell, and I know... Even though he has no cardio, which is a problem, he's going to continue to come forward, which is a good thing. So I, you left it with sort of a mixed bag of how you feel about Preston Parsons, but I know I can trust him to come forward and grind. Wish I could rely on his cardio, but I also think he may have blown his wad thinking that there was a stoppage there when there wasn't. Anyway, he's taking on Matt Semmelsberger. Matt's stepping up on short notice. Matt's an aggressive striker. He comes forward. He's got solid leg kicks, good body work. Plenty of power in both of his hands. He has 10 knockdowns in nine UFC fights. The marching forward can wilt some people. I mean, Preston might be one of those guys. We'll find out. But the marching forward can wilt some of those people, but it can also get him in trouble. He comes forward, he bombs, and it leaves him open for takedowns. He has a 50% takedown defense. He has given up 12 takedowns. Six of them were against Jeremiah Wells, and he is coming off that knockout loss to Uros Medik. And despite Matt Semmelsberger stepping up on short notice, Preston Parsons is the underdog in this matchup. Slight underdog. He's plus 106. And I think that's a perfect line. He should be an underdog. He's not nearly as dangerous. He can be knocked out. And I still picked him to win. And I do have a small quarter of a unit bet on him at those plus 105 odds. I'm just hoping Preston Parsons weathers an early storm. If he can weather an early storm, he can come back get the takedowns, and win this fight exactly the same way that Jeremiah Wells did. The same way that Jeremiah beat Matt Semmelsberger, Preston Parsons can beat Matt Semmelsberger. The only difference is Jeremiah's got some solid cardio. Preston, we we got to wait and see. We've only really seen him gas one time, but you see somebody gas and you're going to worry about that a little bit. Obviously, Matt Semmelsberger, in every fight that he's in, he's got that big one-punch knockout power. That could happen in this matchup, and it would not even be that surprising. That's why my bet on Preston is only a quarter of a unit. But I just don't see that happening. Preston's going to be the pick. I've got that little small bet on Preston, but when we get actual prop bets, I'm going to have another bet on this fight, and it's going to be Matt Semmelsberger inside the distance decision, no action. All that's saying is if Matt Semmelsberger wins by finish, you'll get paid. If he loses a decision or even wins a decision, you get a full refund. The only way you lose that bet is if Preston Parsons finishes Matt Semmelsberger, which I don't see happening. I Yes, nine submission wins and 10 fights. I get it. I still think that Preston's just going to be shooting a million takedowns. Matt will stay tough. Matt is very tough. I think he'll defend some takedowns. Get take, like I think it'll be a scrappy, fun fight. I don't necessarily think Preston's going to submit Matt Semmelsberger. So we'll see what the odds are for when that fight drops. I think Matt's the more dangerous of the two, despite how many submission wins Preston has. Keep in mind, most of those submission wins were pre-UFC against regional guys. So Preston is the pick. Quarter of a unit bet on him. But I'm going to be biting my nails nervous as hell this whole time because Matt Semmelsberger is that guy when he wants to be. Then we have the featured prelim of the evening. We have 44-year-old Andre Orlovsky. He might be, somebody fact check this, look it up, let me know. He might be the oldest active guy on the roster. 44 years old, dude, we joke about 39. 44 is, I mean, that's, that's five more than 39. He's a pretty old guy. And at heavyweight, I mean, that's old. He's taking on Waldo Cortez Acosta. And Andre, 
He's old. I mean, he can't help that. I wish I wasn't old. He can't help that. I mean, look at the beard, the hair. I mean, that's a great looking 44. He's a former world champion. If you've been watching this as long as I have, at one point in time, Andre Olovsky was the most feared man on planet Earth. In his prime, he was knocking everybody out whenever he wanted to, and he was a Sambo guy. It was absolutely incredible what this guy was able to do when he wasn't 44 years old. He's got very good boxing, pretty good kicks, firmly. Like, I don't even want to say the back nine of his career. He's on the, this is it. This is the 18th hole of his career. Like, this is it. He's been fighting for 20 years. He brings all of that knowledge, though, into every single fight. Obviously, at this age, the question is going to be, is his chin going to hold up? And unfortunately, we have the answer. It's no. Didn't hold up in his last fight. It's not going to hold up in this one. Literally every single skill. He has every single skill you would ever need to be successful in this sport. He's just too old. And the chin. But that came with the age. He's taking on Waldo Cortez Acosta. This guy's fun. He's athletic. Tough as nails. Very real power. He does get flashy and at times has decided to dance in the middle of a fight. He lands an incredible seven significant strikes per minute and has showed us on numerous occasions how physically tough he is. And by that, I mean we have watched people just light this dude's legs up and he is completely unfazed. Completely unfazed. I don't know how it's possible, but completely unfazed. He's coming off that knockout win over Lucas Bresky where he still managed to have his legs chewed up, but he did show us that huge power. Here's a little fun fact for you. Waldo and I... And Jacob are in a movie together. We're all in a movie together. It's called The Burden of Nine Lives. That'll be out shortly. So, hey, watch the movie. Support your boys. Tell them that you watched it because of your boys. Anyway, pick-wise, I'm going to go with Waldo here. I, I have to. I'm positive. Andre Arlovsky is the better fighter. And that's not a slight to Waldo. That's 44 years old, 20 years of fighting, former world champion. He's fought uh, two generations of great heavyweights. And he's beaten most of them. But he's old. I mean, he's just old. Chin is gone. He's slowing down. He, I just, I don't see him winning this fight. And this is a very unforgiving sport when it comes to aging. You can't, can't Derek Cheater your way through this. You can't, you know, Tom Brady your way through it where you got all the talent. Just we'll bring in some people to protect you. Or Derek Cheater, like, ah, he's lost a step. Is he the best shortstop in the game? No, but he's a leader. He's still there. Blah, blah, blah. This is not that sport. Can't do that here. Unfortunately, time has caught up to Andre Orlovsky. Waldo Cortez Acosta is the absolute pick here. The odds indicate that as well. Let's wait for some prop bets. Waldo inside the distance is probably a pretty safe bet as well. Here's a little bit of a look into that movie. It's called The Burden of Nine Lives. Jakey Boy and I have our little cameo in there. So check it out. You can find them on the social media. And thank you to Vega Montanez for reaching out. That's how we ended up in this. He reached out. Hey guys, big fan, making a movie. You want to be in it? Who the hell says no to that? And let me plug premium real quick. Safety parlay. This is mine. It is one of my points of pride. I mentioned we hit six of the last seven. We're averaging almost two units of net profit every single month. As I mentioned, that includes the weeks off. That includes the breaks. And we're at a 70.83 event percent accuracy. It continues to be a resounding success and to hit bets, to hit a parlay at that percentage in the most volatile sport is something that I am very proud of. Unlock the safety parlay and everything else at wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member at the top. Then we have Phil Hawes in the main card opener. He's taking on Bruno Fajeda. Phil Hawes, we've broken this guy down a million times over. And he's such a tough read because he's a phenomenal wrestler. He's got a ton of power. He's very explosive. His striking technique is very good. Very good. Almost too good because he's been piecing up people lately. And then he thinks he's a striker and he gets himself knocked out because he has no chin whatsoever. This guy's a high-level athlete. He can win fights striking. He can win fights grappling. But again, without any chin at all, he can't really engage in the striking. He has to just lean all in on the wrestling. And it's a problem. It sucks. And he can't help that. You're born with the chin. That's it. You can't improve your chin, your ability to take a punch. It just is what it is. But this guy's an incredible athlete who's insanely fast, very good wrestling, national champion level wrestling, and just, you hit him, and he's got issues. He's coming off that loss to Ikram Alaskirov, where he looked absolutely fantastic, and then done, out. And that's a problem. That just is what it is. He can't help that. I think he's the better, arguably, the better fighter in most matchups, and then he loses 
because of his chin. Except when he lost to Roman deletes it. That wasn't his chin. Uh, the the official result will be his chin, but Roman almost blew that. Like the fact that he didn't break bones on Phil is crazy. And then he cracked him. Phil's taking on Bruno Fajeda. This guy's a powerful striker. He's light on his feet, constantly mixing up his attacks. He's bouncing on his toes, and that really helps him come in and out of the pocket well. He has incredible spinning techniques. I don't even know if I want to call it a technique, but this guy's just spinning and knocking people out, and he's done that more than one time. Even though he is fast, he's powerful, he's a striker, he's got all finishes, he isn't reckless and can actually be a pretty low-volume guy because he's waiting for his spots. He can grapple as well with some powerful takedown, slick BJJ, but he's definitely a striker, and he's only using his grappling if he's in some trouble or if his opponent's initiated. He's coming off that finish loss to Nurzelton Ruzaboyev, where he was taken down for the first time in his UFC career. And just last fight, I talked about Andre Olovsky. I said he's going to be the better fighter, but he has no chin. He's old. Same thing here, except the old. 35 is not that old. Phil Hall is going to be the better fighter. He's going to be faster. He's going to hit harder. He's going to be more athletic, more skilled. He's going to be the better fighter, but he's got no chin. And that's the concern here because Bruno Fajeda hits like a freight train. He could absolutely get to Phil's chin. Nobody on this planet would be surprised if Bruno finds Phil's chin. I am still going to pick Phil. I just have a soft spot for my high-level wrestlers. This guy is so good. He's so talented. We just watched Bruno get taken down for the first time in his UFC career. We watched him get finished. And hopefully Phil will come forward. Phil's last fight against Alice Kirov, he fought a high-level wrestler. So he didn't really engage in the wrestling. In this fight, Bruno's not a high-level wrestler. Hopefully... Phil will come forward and shoot. My fear is Phil's going to come forward, have a little bit of success striking, be like, no, okay, I'm winning these exchanges. I'm good. And then get caught. That's probably what's going to happen. I'm still going to go out on a limb. I'm still going to pick Phil Hawes to win. He's better everywhere. And let's just, I'm just going to, I'm going to believe, baby. I'm going to believe that his chin's not going to get touched. He'll take Bruno down, make something happen. Hopefully. For the love of God, hopefully. I'm not, you can't bet on this fight, though. This, it's just not a fight you can bet on. But I'm going to lean Phil. I want Phil to win. I've been following his career for a little bit. He's got all the freaking tools. Let's hope Phil wins. Then we got Ricky Simone taking on Mario Bautista. Ricky Simone is an absolute wrestling beast. This guy's going to dive at legs with 100% energy just over and over and over until he gets a takedown, potentially a submission. His biggest asset is his gas tank. He's just going to stick to a game plan, never slow down. He's not a technical striker, but he does have some striking. He throws stuff. He stays busy. He uses it to set up his takedowns. He did show us some power against Rafael Asuncao and Jack Shore. He's coming off that main event loss to Song Yudong this spring, or last spring, 2023 spring, where he had two takedowns, but the striking was just, he just could not keep up with Song striking. He's taking on Mario Batista. This guy's high volume, get one to give one style striker. He sets his own nice pace. He's always plotting forward. And while he is light on his feet, he is constantly moving. He will plant those feet and then let his hands go. He has been steadily evolving in his last few fights. He's got five wins in a row with 12 takedowns. He's coming off that close win over Damon Blackshear where he landed fewer strikes and had fewer takedowns. And Mario Batista is a really fun guy. He's an exciting guy to watch. He does not have the takedown defense to hang with Ricky Simone. I just don't think he does. I see Ricky getting takedown after takedown and suffocating Mario. The concern, obviously, is that Ricky has had issue with high-volume strikers in the past. Moth of that moat, moat, moth. I'm going to blame that one on the flu and not whatever speech impediment I got going on. Most of those high-volume strikers that Ricky has lost to have better takedown defense than Mario does. Ricky's the pick. I have a full unit. One full unit, $100. The unit for me is $100. I have $100 on Ricky at minus 144. He is sitting at minus 170. Premium members, you got yourself some value there. Ricky Simone's going to be the pick. I just think Mario Batista, is. Just, it's going to be too much to defend all of those takedowns just over and over and over again. And I see Ricky with three rounds to work with. Doesn't even have to think about cardio. Then we have Jim Miller. UFC 100. UFC 200 and UFC 300's Jim Miller taking on Gabriel Benitez. Jim Miller, also the only fighter in this card that opened as an underdog and will likely close as a favorite. 
He's a legend. He has multiple records in the UFC for longevity, like most minutes, most fight, all that crap. Ridiculous amount of fights, ridiculous amount of time in the octagon, ridiculous longevity. He's 40. Andre Olofsky's 44. He's younger than Andre Olofsky and has put in more time in the UFC. It's absolutely incredible. He is definitely just starting to slow his age. He's definitely starting to slow down a little bit. He does continue to defy his age, defy the logic in the octagon. His most recent win was 23-second knockout win over Jesse Butler this summer. Overall, Jim Miller's a high-level grappler. He's a good BJJ guy that you, know, you fight long enough, you get good at everything. Now he's got good striking. All of a sudden, later in his career, he has power. That is newer to him over the last couple of years. So Jim Miller just seems to be the Jersey tough guy that isn't aging out. He's taking on Gabriel Benitez. This guy's a very good kickboxer. He specifically, he's got great kicks, great movement. He's going to pick his shots well, and he's got some very real power. His takedown defense is only at 58%. His takedown offense is at an even lower 50%. And while he does have some grappling tools, like solid BJJ, he doesn't really use them. He only has two takedowns in 13 UFC fights, and he has fallen in love with chasing that knockout. He's coming off a win over Charlie Ontiveros a little over a year ago. And it's impossible to break down Jim Miller at this point. This guy is old. He's slowing down, but he's discovered power later in life, knocking people. Dude, just knock somebody out in 23 seconds. He's always been Jersey tough. Jim Miller's incredible. This guy's incredible. Is he the best fighter of all time? No, of course not. Is he one of the more underrated guys who has just been here forever doing what he does at a decent level? He's never top five, never bottom five, never on the verge of being cut, never on the verge of a title shot, just always there putting in the time, putting in the work, beating good people, losing to who he's supposed to lose. To. It's What Jim Miller has put together is just an incredible body of work. Dana White has already said Jim Miller will be fighting at UFC 300. He'll be the only person ever to fight at 100, 200, and 300. It's incredible. Think about that. That's 100 events between 100 and 200. Between 200 and 300. That's 200 different UFC events. Just from UFC 200 to 300. They don't even do a pay-per-view a month. But even if they did a pay-per-view a month, there's only 12 months in a year. This is, I mean, this is some, this is some goodwill hunting math. How quickly I did that. Anyway. Jim Miller is the epitome of just Jersey tough, come forward, gonna grind, grit, make something happen kind of guy. I think he wins this fight. Very low confident. How confident could I possibly be in a guy that is 40 years old? Gabriel Benitez is still a dangerous guy. He's a good striker. He's got power. The power is there. Jim Miller's 40. And yes, he's tough, but eventually that chin won't hold up. So Jim Miller's gonna be the pick. He developed his own power. I wish his takedowns were a little bit better so I can trust the wrestling a little more. But, you know, Jim Miller is going to be the pick. I do think he wins this fight. The odds here, he opened as a dog. He's going towards favorite. He's minus money now. He's a little bit of a favorite on most books. And I think a lot of that just has to do with Gabriel's layoff and things of that nature. Hopefully, there's no injury. Regardless of who wins this fight, hopefully, like if Jim Miller loses, let's just hope it's like a you know, I don't know, decision. Something harmless so that he can fight at UFC 300 because I think that's just such a cool... I don't know who they're going to give him. Should be somebody else of like this veteran, bring somebody back, I don't know, but somebody who's been fighting for 100 years as well just to honor the OGs. So Jim Miller's going to be the pick. I'm going to leave this alone. I'm not going to spend money on a 40-year-old. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have Matoush Nikolaou taking on Manel Kopp. This is a rematch. Matoush Nikolaou won the first fight, but Manel is the good size favorite in that rematch. Matoush Nikolaou is a very good, clean striker. He's incredibly technical. He's also a competent grappler. He's got 10 takedowns in eight UFC wins. Two of those takedowns were against this guy, Manel Kopp. And when he gets it to the ground... He's going to stick with control. He's going to work towards a submission when they present themselves. He's not going to chase anything. He's not going to risk a position to try to sub you. He just snapped a six-fight win streak with an early knockout loss to Brandon Roy Val. He's taking on Manel Kopp. This guy's fast. He's explosive. Very good striker who has no issues taking knockouts. 
He's a southpaw with good pressure, and he bounces in and out of that range really well. He's a decent wrestler when he needs to be, and he closes distance well when he wants to. He's very fun to watch, but at times, he's having a little too much fun, and he might make a mistake or two. He's coming off that decision win over Felipe Dos Santos, where he had the better striking, a knockdown, and a takedown. I mentioned this is a rematch. Manel lost that fight almost three years ago. Since that fight, Manel has won four in a row, and Nicolau won three before he just lost to Brandon Royval. Manel is now the two-to-one favorite, a little bit more, actually, in this rematch. And I get that the first fight was close. Manel was winning the striking exchanges, but he was also taken down twice, gave up half a round of control time. A lot of people think Manel got robbed in that first fight. I do think Cop has evolved more than Matouche Nicolau has in the last three years, but he can still get taken down. Cop's going to be the pick here because it was clear that his striking was better in that first fight. And now Matouche's chin might be suspect. Not suspect, but certainly compromised. It was just gave up on him a couple months ago. I do think the line's a little bit wide, though. I mean, Manel Cop lost that first fight. And it's not like he was winning, 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 then quick sub. Like, he lost the first fight. Very close, but he lost that fight. This one could go similarly. Manel's going to be the pick. I think he's going to get it done, but I'm not going to bet on this fight. I, I, you know, just let's just leave it alone. At least for me, as you know, I'm a conservative better. Jacob will take chances. Jacob's chasing these, you know, plus 500 props. I'm sticking with a little bit more, in my mind, safe type bets, even though this sport, nothing safe here. Manel Cop's going to be the pick. No bet. I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to enjoy. This is a very solid co-main event. Then we have the main event of the evening. We have Magomed and have taken on Johnny Walker. These two just fought a few months ago. It's a rematch. There was an accidental knee that caused a no contest a few minutes into the first round. We didn't get to see much, but we did see Ankalaev just sort of squeeze out a takedown and Johnny actually did look good up until that point. He was his old fun stealth taking chances, doing all that stuff instead of a weird gun shy striker. But yeah, no way to know how that was going to end because it did end with an illegal knee and it was a no contest. Magomed Ankavalaev is a long kickboxer. He uses range well. He's got some devastating kicks. He has power in both his hands and his feet. He's very versatile in his attack style, though. He's got solid striking defense. He can be a little bit low volume. If he gets into trouble striking, he does have a wrestling backup game plan. He averages around one takedown per 15 minutes. He's got one single loss in his record. That was literally just a last-second submission loss to Paul Craig in his UFC debut. He is not the most exciting fighter in the world, but he might be the best, certainly one of the best light heavyweights. He's taking on Johnny Walker, big, athletic, light heavyweight. This dude is 6'6". Six, six. He's absolutely massive. He's fast. He's powerful. He's athletic. He's wild. He's fun to watch. He gets very creative with his striking. He's going to spin. He's going to jump. He's going to smile. He's going to do all the things. There was a small period of time between 2021, 2022, where he moved over to Conor McGregor's gym and they just sort of sucked the fun right out of this guy. All of a sudden, he thought he was a technical striker, was trying to do things right. That's not who he is. But now he seems to be back. He is having fun. He's out there. He's smiling. He's spinning. He's kicking. He's doing all the crazy stuff. And that's the Johnny Walker you want to see. A, as a fan. B, if I'm his agent, that's the Johnny Walker that wins fights. Not the technical guy. But Johnny's a powerful striker who can snatch up a submission and he uses his size really, really well in fights. Ankalaev is coming off back-to-back. -back, two fights in a row. Where there was no real outcome. He had a draw against Jan. No contest against Johnny. But I do think skill for skill, he's one of the best guys in the division. We saw a few minutes of this fight already. I don't think much is going to be different here. I think Ankalaev will avoid a couple of spinning big shots, squeeze his way in, grab Johnny Walker, drag him to the ground, wear him down, make something happen. I think Makamed Ankalaev is going to win this fight. Should he be a minus 500 favorite or whatever the hell it is? I don't... I, I want to say yes, but I don't know. I don't think so. This guy's two fights in a row where there wasn't a finish. Or wasn't a, a clear winner. And the Jan one was the one that was like, should have won that fight, dude. What the hell was that? This one, fine. There was an accident. It is what it is. But the Jan one, the hell's going on there? I do think Ankolaev can win this fight. I think he can take Johnny down. I think he will take Johnny down. I think he's desperate for a win. 
and I think he's going to get that win. Magomed Ankalaev is the pick. Pretty confident in him to get this done. He is not affordable. I'm not going to be betting it because Johnny Walker is one of the more dangerous guys in the division, and shit, man, anything can happen. We watched Paul Craig submit Magomed Ankalaev. But Ankalaev is the pick. Let me know in the comments who you think wins this fight. I know Jakey Boy, I believe, is on the other side of this one. Guys, become a premium member. Unlock the detailed data metrics and analytics. Unlock the line movement tracker. Get the safety parlay. Get access to all of the analysts. It's not just me and Jacob. We got the MMA Minute. He's giving you picks, bets, outcomes for every single fight. He's got 30,000 followers on Tiki Taki. We got Running Mouth MMA. There are three of you giving their picks, bets, and insight. We have Artem breaking down far more than just UFC. He's going to give you LFA, PFL, all of those fights. And we also have the pick doctor. This guy's a neurophysicist who has developed an AI. And that AI is picking fights based solely off of historical data. And it is doing so at an incredible accuracy. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's only $10 a month. Once you are a premium member, then just take our quick survey asking you what you enjoy about premium membership, what you would like to add to premium membership, all the other features that you want, what else you're looking for, all of that stuff. Because the results of this survey is what's going to define how we work and what we do the rest of this year. We already have a game plan. We're allocating money to different tools and things like that. So let's make sure we're doing it right. Fill out the survey. It benefits us, which only benefits you because you guys are using the product. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only 10 dollars a month for the greatest premium offering in this space that will do nothing but evolve and get better week in and week out.